Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Welcome to the program. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ in the KEIT viewing area. A list of the churches will be scrolled across the screen at the end of the program. Each of these congregations extends to you a warm welcome and invite you to come and visit and study with them about the great salvation that Jesus Christ made available to all of us. If you have any questions about your salvation uh, or about other Bible subjects, feel free to contact any of the Churches of Christ in your area. My name is Jeff Heitman, and I have the privilege of working with the Lord's Church at Brooklyn Church Christ. Today's lesson, I'm going to ask you a question as we answer, how are your eyes? And I do hope you have a copy of the Bible. I urge you to follow along with me. We're going to be starting in 1 Peter chapter 5. The eyes are said to be the windows to the soul. The eyes do tell a lot about a person. There are a lot of different kind of eyes, but Christian eyes are always supposed to be wide awake. So Peter, when he writes in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, a familiar verse that says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Be watchful, what he says. Be awake. Be aware of your surroundings. Have your eyes wide open. And it's because the devil is most certainly real. He's continually trying to deceive people. So how are your eyes? Are they evil eyes or are they good eyes? We're going to note several in both categories. Now, we start by first noticing what evil eyes are. In Matthew chapter 5, we start by noticing adulterous eyes. Matthew chapter 5, if you read verses 27 and 28, he says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The sin of adultery was and is so detestable in the sight of God, that it was something that it was given as one of the Ten Commandments. We notice that the evil eyes of adultery, when it talks about, looks on a woman with lust. Looks on a woman to already think about what they're going to do. And this, this is saying that it is a sin in the heart and the mind of that person. In God's sight, the moral failure is already present, and that's why it is wrong. When the lust is present... The sin is already present. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14, Peter also writes about this same idea. 
2 Peter 2.14 says, Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling, unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children. Those evil people look to lust, and they're never satisfied by their own indulgence. That They're often unstable and undependable, and they're even always trying to entice others to, to join in and to follow their sinful ways. That's why that is wrong. We next look at envious eyes. We go to the Old Testament. We look at Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 18. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, if we notice verses 7 and 8. And the woman answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and unto me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Saul eyed David from that day forward. You see, Saul became very jealous of David. He envied David. That, that is, he was watching him with jealousy. But his jealousy was a rage that led him to alienate David and Jehovah and to bring about his own bitter end. From this time forward, Saul watched David with a suspicious and jealous eye. This is something that we need to learn from and to avoid and not to do. If you go back to the New Testament, back to the book of Matthew, chapter 27, in Matthew 27, verses 17 and 18, we find where it says, Therefore... When they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Notice what is said next. For he knew that for envy, which is jealousy, they had delivered him. The word envy in ancient writings implies somewhat more than it does now. It signified all the hostile feelings which are under the, the same general term of unpopularity even. Fear of his power with the people, jealousy of his purity even, his wisdom and miracles, a, a, a mean desire to crush a good and great man. That's what jealousy did. With all the wicked, malicious feelings of a fickle multitude, it's ranked under the word envy as used here. So don't have envious eyes. Still in the book of Matthew, but if you back up to Matthew chapter 7, we notice critical eyes. We see this a lot. In Matthew 7, verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? You see, here is the problem with critical eyes. And they see the problems that everyone else has, that everyone else is falling into, but they seem to overlook their own problems. Here it says, your brother has this tiny, this minuscule problem, this speck in his eye, and yet you or I have a log or a huge problem compared to this brother's problem, yet we seem to overlook our own faults while we condemn that brother. We see this a lot in the world, and he's telling us not to have critical eyes. In the book of Romans chapter 14, I want you to notice what Paul writes. Paul writes in Romans 14 verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and, and having critical eyes, we need to understand that a change needs to be made. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, it reminds us of something that we really should do. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Where the critical eye falls short is that no person has either the right or the power to, uh, to examine the heart and the mind of a fellow Christian, of anybody else but your own. We need to examine ourselves. We need to find out that we are in the right relationship, and if we're not, we need to change that. We go to the book of Acts now, the Acts of the Apostles. In Acts chapter 8, as we notice, covetous eyes. In Acts 8, verses 18 and 19, we, we notice Simon. And it says, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, 
saying, Give me also this power that on whom I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. It's greed that happened here. You see, greed seems to have taken over Simon when he saw something that he wanted for himself, something that could make him great or make great gain for himself, instead of being happy for others. We need to be happy for others. Going to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. You know, the Bible is, is here reminding us again of the difference between the world and what we should be following. Because 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And this is true. This speaks of lust of the eyes, being of the world, that is worldly things, wanting things that are not above, they're not of God, they're of this world. They take our focus off of where they need to be. And so we really need to be careful about that. When someone covets something, what really happens to them? The Bible tells us, when we go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, we look at verse 10, and Paul even mentions this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Here is the basic problem with coveting something. It is the love of wealth, not wealth itself. It's not wrong to have things. It's not wrong to have money, but it's the love of that because that love will take us away from God and where our focus needs to be at. The faith from which some have wandered away from reaching out for wealth is the doctrine of Christ. We need to hold on to the doctrine and let that guide us, let that lead us in the right paths. We're going to go back to the book of Matthew one more time, Matthew chapter 13, and we need to notice closed eyes. We see this a lot in the world today too, people with closed eyes. In Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And listen to this, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart. And then he says this, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Jesus spoke of the Jews who were unwilling to hear that message, unwilling to see what the truth is. They had lost their ability to hear and understand. We should ask ourselves, do we do this very same thing? Are our eyes closed to the truth? Let's have our eyes wide open. Let's see what's really going on. Let's see what the Word of God says. Let's help others see. If we go back to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, just after giving the Christian graces, Peter says this, 2 Peter 1 and verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. One who fails to add these Christian graces that are just before this, if you read through it, is blind, can't see sin, a forgotten even that he or she is in sin, that the sins were washed away by the blood of the Lamb, we cannot be blind to what's going on. We cannot be blind to what the Bible says. In 2 Peter, if we're going to go ahead just a little bit to chapter 3 in verse 5. 2 Peter 3, 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The marvel of sight is a treasure we take for granted a lot of times. We do not see with our eyes. Instead, it is the brain that the countless bits of information is presented in living color. People willingly ignore all the evidences of divine creation and intelligent design in all things if we would just look around and see it. Isn't it a marvelous thing that our Creator saw it fit to place two eyes in our heads. Are we keeping both eyes open? I truly hope that we are. Well, after looking at evil eyes for just a few minutes, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10, and we start now by looking at good eyes. 
the kind of good eyes that we're supposed to have, compassionate eyes. In Luke chapter 10, we read of the story about the Good Samaritan. You might remember this. So in Luke chapter 10, if we look at verse 33, for example, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. A Samaritan is what he talks about here. Now, a Samaritan was a person that no self-respecting Jew would help, and none would want help from this kind of person. Yet Jesus said it was a Samaritan that was moved to pity, moved to compassion, had compassion in noticing that someone else needed help. Someone else has fallen on hard times. He said this is what the example should be. In the story about the prodigal son, we go to Luke chapter 15, just a few chapters over. In Luke 15 and verse 20, after this son had gotten his wealth gone off and spent it all falling on hard times, we look at verse 20 now. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So the father showed compassion, showed tender sympathy for him. This is a great example of how we are to act as well. Do we have compassionate eyes? I hope that we do. I truly hope that we do. How about going to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. We notice that we should have faithful eyes. The Bible speaks about that. In Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight, and a sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Is this what fills our eyes? To look to the faith is to look to Jesus. It's to look to his word, to look to the faith that guides us, that leads us in the right paths. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11. I want to back up just a minute because those faithful eyes are to be those who faithfully serve him, and this should be us. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to read verses 8 through 10, but we have this great example of all these people, by faith, this person did this, and by faith, this person did this. And now we get down here to Abraham. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What a great example to look at. By faith, because Abraham believed God. His focus was on things of above and, and what God would have for him to do. He looked for a city. He expected. He looked for. He waited for this perfect city. The hope of that eternal city was so bright in the heart and mind of Abraham that worldly possessions were of little or no value to him. Is this the way that we see it? Because this is another great example. This is why it's in the Bible for us to follow, for us to hopefully one day be listed as, by faith, this person did this. If we back up to Matthew chapter 14, when we talk about faithful eyes, in Matthew 14, I want to notice verses 28 through 30. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee under the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the boisterous winds, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. This, this is the example of Peter walking on the water. We know this. We've read this before. But this is by faith that he jumped out of the boat. He started walking. He was walking on the water by the Lord's power. After he began walking on the water, well, then he noticed something else. He, he noticed this boisterous wind. He noticed something when he took his eyes off of the Lord. So he began to sink. And yes, Jesus caught him and he rebuked him for his little faith, for his doubting, for his taking his faithful eyes off of where they need to be. 
So this is why this is a great example for us to follow. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes our faith needs to be refocused on the Lord. Sometimes we need to be reminded of being faithful again. So have faithful eyes and look to the Bible to continually do that for us. How about going to John chapter 11? We, we need to have sympathetic eyes. Now this is the example that we have here of Jesus and he's going where Lazarus has died. The sisters had called for him. So in John 11, we read verses 33, 34, and 35. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Weep with those who weep is what the natural response of those who, who are following the Lord, who love the Lord, that's what they're going to do. The sorrowing person or people need to have others that are going to be there with them and weep with them and help them through their trying times. Jesus showed sympathy. He showed sympathy because Mary and Martha, were, they were so burdened with grief. And this is something that he cared for them, just as we are to care for others. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, we see another great example of this. Matthew 23, verse 37, the Bible says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Here we find Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, weeping because of the hard-hearted unbelief that they had. Do we have sympathy for others, especially sympathy for those that are lost in sin? As a Christian, we should because this is our job to go help those. Now, when we notice Romans chapter 8, we notice having hopeful eyes. In Romans 8, verses 18 and 19, Paul writes and says, For I reckon that, she, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The expectations or the hope as Christians is looking forward to receive that new spiritual body. We know that these bodies ache, these bodies break down, we've got problems with them. And the Bible reassures us in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 44 and other places that we can look at that we're going to receive a new body, and it's going to be a glorious body, this spiritual body at the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. What a wonderful thing to hope for, to have that beautiful spiritual body. In Philippians 3, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation, th th this is our citizenship. The way that we live is supposed to be in heaven for those who remain faithful. Finally, I want to point out, going back to the book of John chapter 9, that we should have open eyes. In John 9, verses 10 and 11, Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. This wonderful story reminds me of one very important fact, and that is his, his eyes were opened by the Lord. His eyes were opened by the Lord, and our eyes are supposed to be opened by the Lord as well. God has an amazing power to do that if we just rely on Him, if we just trust Him. The power of God's Word, it works only if we are looking for the truth. If we open up our Bibles and find that, and if our eyes are open to accept that. Those who claim their own knowledge of religion have closed their eyes to the light. God's Word is the light. In Psalms 119, verse 105, the Bible says God's Word is the light. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we take our Bibles and we open it up and we read and understand, the light of that glorious gospel springs forth into our eyes, into our minds, into our hearts. Our eyes are open to the word of God and his teachings. So we need to ask ourselves, do we have faithful eyes looking 
to that city? Or are we having evil eyes? Envious, critical, closed eyes. How are your eyes? How are your eyes and do you need a physician? Because we have the greatest physician of all. Spiritually speaking, we know that you can come to Jesus, that great physician, and he can heal your eyes. He can take away all of the sin, take away every problem that you have. We're supposed to cast all our cares upon God, and he can do that. If we have these faithful eyes, if we have these hopeful eyes, if we have compassionate eyes, if we have those good eyes that we're supposed to have, then we can have heaven as our home when life is over. Now, we know we have that because we obey the gospel. If we obey the gospel the way that the Word of God says, the Bible says that we're supposed to have faith. We get our faith from reading the Bible. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it even tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. You can't please God without faith. So have faith from reading the Bible. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, because John 5, verse 24, it lets us know that we're going to die in our sins if we do not believe that He is, that He is the Son of God, that He's done what He's done for us. Believe with all of our heart, and then we can understand everything else He's asked us to do, because that belief shows us that He's come down from heaven. He's died for our sins, and so we repent of that sinful life, that sinful life that He's died for. We confess him before men. Confession is made with the mouth. We are then needing to be baptized because sin separates us from God. And the best part about it, in Acts 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This is what the Bible says for salvation. And I hope that you've done that. If not, please continue reading your Bibles. Thank you. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.